Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. As always, we have Michael Langemeyer joining us to do a repeat series here that we're doing on the show. Before I share more about that, Michael, how are you? Pretty good. How are you? Good. good. It's so nice to see you again on camera. Those of you that are regular listeners, you'll know Michael. If you do not, I'll give you a short little bio and then we'll dive right in. So Michael is the Associate Director with the Center for Commercial Agriculture, and he is a professor with the Department of Agricultural Economics, Purdue University. So today we're doing, I guess we can call this a series now, Measuring Optimism in Agriculture based on a report that Purdue does, and I know you're going to dive more, dive in and share more information, and it's about the egg economy barometer. So, Michael, before I, uh, before I start asking you questions and we start talking about the report, do you want to tell our audience just a little bit about who you are and what you do for the new listeners? Yeah, so my primary areas of, of emphasis are agriculture finance, but I also do quite a bit of work in, in farm management, succession planning, uh, cost of production, uh, and leasing, uh, so various topics related related to farm, farm management. Excellent. Okay, I know we've done at least one or two of these already, but our channel is growing, which is exciting, and we have new listeners. So can you share more about what the Egg Economy Barometer is? Yeah, first of all, we've been doing this for several years now. In fact, we started uh, in late 2015, and it's a monthly survey that goes out to approximately 400 U.S. agriculture producers uh, engaged in different crop and livestock enterprises. We we do exclude people that are uh, primarily uh, primarily interested in fruits and vegetables uh, and 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 nuts. Uh, but other than that, it covers the full spectrum uh, of U.S. agriculture. And the sediment survey is, is patterned after the consumer sediment survey that comes out of the University of Michigan. And so the, the Michigan survey focuses on consumers uh, in the U.S., uh, broadly defined. Uh, and what we focus on is producer sediment or, per, or sediment for uh, U.S. agriculture producers. And so it, it's important to, to realize this is a sediment survey. And so it, it's certainly correlated with some things that are going on currently, but it also encaptures uh, uncertainty. And so people are really worried about some certain events happening. Uh, let's say there's a big geopolitical shock or there's a big shock in policy or big shock in trade policy. It, it is reflected in the producer sediment uh, sediment results. And so uh, and, and so it's, it's interesting uh, to, to watch this uh, from month to month. And, and essentially, we have uh, a series of questions that we ask every month. And then uh, we have some questions that we ask just periodically. Uh, for example, I'm going to talk about the, the August survey that took place in mid-August and, re and was released the first Tuesday of September. But the September survey, just as an example, asked a bunch of questions about cover crops. And so every so often we ask we ask specific questions, but uh, but the sediment questions are asked every month. We ask every month uh, about financial performance, uh, what they think the financial performance looks like this year compared to last year, what it looks like this year compared uh, to, to next year. We also ask questions every month uh, related to whether this is a good time or bad time to invest in machinery uh, in buildings. Uh, and then every month we also get a gauge on, on, on individuals' uh, perspectives on where land values may be going in the next year and where land uh, values are going in the next five years. So I've summarized uh, some of the questions that uh, that we get a lot of uh, a lot of interest in uh, from from various reporters and farmers and agribusiness personnel. Excellent. So as you mentioned, we are talking about the August survey, and it was released September fifth, I do believe. Do you want to touch on the overall feeling? And then what I will do is just go through and ask you on each of those points, each of the survey points, and get your thoughts and what the producer shared with you. Okay, I'll start with the overall Ag Economy Barometer Index. There's okay. five questions that go into the index. Some of those are more current oriented. We'll talk about uh, what we can expand on that here in a little bit. Others are related to future expectations. And so some of it's very current uh, this year compared to last year, this year compared to the next 12 months. Some of those are, are more long-term, 
uh, the situation today compared to five years from now? And so we put all those, all those five questions together and we come up with an index. And, and the index of 100 would, be, uh, would, be, uh, would reflect where the index was in the first six months of the survey which was late 2015, early 2016. So just give, uh, just give the listener some idea of, of, of the index values. Uh, but the index value for August was 115, uh, which is down from what it was in June, June and July. In June and July, uh, it was in the, in the low 120s. Since so we've seen a little bit of weakness in the anti-economy barometer uh, you know, uh, uh, coming into August. Okay, okay. Perfect. And I just want to make a note. This is on the Purdue University website, right? Yes. Okay. There's perfect. a separate website if you type in Ag Economy Barometer, but you can find you can find this and, and other sources of information uh, going to the Center for Commercial Agriculture website. Okay, perfect. We'll include a link to that in the show notes. Yeah. I could just imagine listeners and viewers going, wait a minute, what was that? And then rewinding. You can get all the information on the website. Well, I'll include There's charts and the report. Uh, there's okay. a written report that, that, that for every month. Okay, excellent. So I think the next section in the report is the indexes of current conditions and future expectations. Did you want to touch on that one? Yes, I, I do want to touch on that. And, and the reason why I watch those very, very closely, and, and first of all, those are made up of subsets of the five questions. So there's some questions that are more current oriented, some questions that are more uh, you know future oriented. So I, yeah, I just wanted to re uh, repeat that. I watch that very closely because, for example, if the current conditions index is below future expectations, that tells me that they're worried about uh, uh, things that are going on now, but they expect the future to be brighter and vice versa. Uh, if, if, if they think the future, if the index for the uh, future expectations is lower than the current conditions, that means they, they're, they're very happy with where they're at today or relatively happy with where they're at today. And they think the future is going to be slightly worse. And so if you look at the history uh, of those two sub indices, as we were going through uh, 16, 17, 18 and 19, the, the index of future expectations tended to be higher than the index of current conditions because in U.S. agriculture, uh, that period uh, had fairly tough uh, uh, financial uh, situation. The, the U.S. net farm income was relatively low during those years. Uh, as we moved into uh, you know 21, when, 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 when uh, prices, uh, prices increased rather dramatically, partially in response to COVID, but also, uh, you know, the geopolitical conflicts, Ukraine, Russia, for example, we saw some price increases, particularly for corn and soybeans. Uh, the index of current conditions climbed above the index of future expectations. The reason why I'm belaboring this is recently we've seen a switch where the index of current conditions is, is actually lower right now than the index of future expectations. And, and what that's reflecting is we have, we, we have, a, ver a fairly large drop in, in U.S. net farm income in 23 compared to 22. Uh, U.S. net farm income is still supposed to be pretty high in 23, but nevertheless, uh, it did drop rather significantly uh, from levels that we experienced in 21 and 22. And so that's dragging down the, the index of current conditions to a level that's below uh, the index of future expectations. Okay. Okay. Excellent. I think the next survey question section index is farm financial performance. And you just touched on that a little bit. Do you want to go into that deeper? Yes, certainly. Uh, we, 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 we create an index with that, but essentially what the question asks uh, is, is financial performance, is financial performance uh, today uh, better than last year, worse than last year, or about the same as last year? And, and the results for, for August were, were not all that surprising. 28% uh, worse, said worse than, uh, which would you expect based on where uh, the U.S. net farm income uh, trends, and 14% said better than. And, and what's partly what's going on here with the divergence is it's 400 U.S. producers, but they're all different commodities. Some commodities have done better than others in, in 23 compared to 22. And I want to highlight something that I think you spent some time on, beef. Uh, the, the beef in particular is, is, is better this year than it was in 22. And, and so you, you have some people that think it's better than, uh, but, but uh, there's more people that think it's worse than. And, and the worst than would be uh, dairy producers, swine producers, and probably corn soybean producers. Uh, you know, a bunch of them would probably think it's uh, 23 is worse than uh, 22. 
right. That makes sense. When we were talking about it earlier in income performance, I'm like, where are the beef producers in here? We're excited. I'm like, yeah. oh, right. It's an average, Tracy. So I'm glad you touched on that because. Yeah, they're about 15% of those that we survey. Okay. Uh, corn and producers are, 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 are uh, 50 to 55%. And okay. so and they're outnumbered. Sense. But but nevertheless, they're a very important part of U.S. agriculture, and so they're they're a pretty important part of this survey. And uh, just to put it in perspective, the, the swine and the dairy uh, producers is more like five percent each, uh, so okay. they're they're much smaller representation in this survey uh, than the beef because we try to do this based on value added by commodity. Okay, uh, that's why corn and soybeans get such a heavy weight. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Thanks for explaining that. So the next one is farm capital investment. Do you want to explain that and then share how it did? Yeah, this one's rather difficult to get a handle on. And so over time, we've added questions to try to figure out a little bit more what's going on. Because when you ask somebody, is this a good time or a bad time to invest in farm capital uh, for, in machinery and buildings? Sometimes you think, well, uh, if their cash flow is, is pretty solid, they're going to say it's a good time. No, <laughs> what's happening here, and this is why we've added questions related to why is this a bad time? Why is this a good time? We've okay. added the, the good time relatively recently. Some people answer that this is a bad time because machinery prices are high. But you know, uh, both used and, and, and new machinery prices are very high today compared to what they were prior to COVID. Uh, and so we've had some lingering uh, impacts of of of, of, of the COVID uh, nineteen, uh, all the supply shortages of parts and all of that. We have some lingering effects of, of that uh, that we're seeing in the survey. And so when we ask people why this is a bad time, many times they indicate it's because that, that because prices are high. Uh, you know, machinery prices and building prices are high. And so that's one of the reasons why they think it's a bad time. And 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 the reason why I'm, I'm dwelling on that is is overwhelmingly. Uh, the producers think it's a bad time to invest in machinery uh, than uh, than it is a good time. Uh, you know, the the percent that say it's a good time is much much smaller uh, than than the percent that say it's a, a bad time. The other thing that comes up uh, when you ask people why this is a bad time to invest in machinery is very obvious. Interest rates have climbed dramatically. I don't know about Canada, but they've increased four percent here in a very short period of time, and and that's got people looking twice. Uh, about whether they make ma major asset purchases, uh, because if you're buying machinery, you may not get a fixed, you may you may not get a fixed loan period, and then uh, even if you do today, uh, you're going to be paying a much higher interest rate than what you paid uh, two years ago, and so that's certainly on people's radar. Uh, when you when you uh, look at the people that say it's a good time, and like I said, that's a smaller group, but there is a group that say it's a good time. There they refer to liquidity and cash flow. Uh, the liquidity coming into 23 is very solid in the United States, along with solid solvency position. So people have cash, uh, you know, for the most part, if they wanted to, to spend that on machinery, they could. Now, always when you talk about liquidity, we have to remember, uh, and I think we've talked about this before uh, on, on this show, you have to remember that that liquidity is used not only to purchase assets, it's a nice down payment to buy an asset, but you also need that liquidity in case net returns are low, one year, one or two years from now. And so we've got to be very careful about liquidity. And 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 a lot of producers are uh, pretty cautious in using that liquidity uh, to buy uh, to buy assets, even when the cash flow uh, is relatively strong. Uh, having said that, if you look at the the U.S. capital expenditures, uh, 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 some data that's kept by USDA ERA, the capital expenditures are up. And this is machinery and buildings. This is not land. Uh, the capital expenditures are up quite a bit. Uh, in 22 and 23. And so even though people say it, it's a bad time, there is some people buying uh, capital assets because you buy assets when your cash flow is relatively strong. Uh, 21, 22, very good cash flow situation, created some liquidity uh, or some cash there that you can use to, to update some of the machines uh, that you have on the farm. Makes sense. Okay. My next question, I know you touched on it. I'm not sure if you want to go into it a little bit deeper. It says primary reason now is a bad time to make large investments. Did we cover that or do you want to go? Primarily, primarily high machinery prices and high interest rates. Okay. Okay. That's what I figured, but I had a note there to ask you that. So I'm no, like, I just wanted to, yeah, those are the two main things that they, they okay. tell us why it's a bad time. 
that makes sense. Okay, thanks for clarifying. So let's go in. We chat about machinery and buildings. That is one area of the farm business. The one I love talking about, of course, because of our platform and what farmer doesn't love land. Let's talk about land. Let's do short term farmland value expectations. And then after that, we can roll into long term. First of all, I want, to, I, want to, I want to say that land values increased rather dramatically in 21 and 22. Uh, the increase in 23 is much, much smaller. And so that that's kind of a, con, a context for this. Another context for this, uh, the, these, these two questions, is in, in U.S. agriculture, and it wouldn't be that different uh, in Canada and Europe, uh, I, I don't think anyway, uh, over 80% of the, of the assets on the balance sheet are land. So land is an extremely important asset uh, in agriculture, both from a solvency standpoint, but also uh, earnings. Uh, you know, one of the one of the sources of earnings for for agriculture uh, over the over the long long term is appreciation in land values, and so this is a very very important asset uh, to keep track of. And so every producer likes to talk about what's going on with land values, and so. Uh, and so let's take a look at those in more detail. We asked two questions. One is short-term, one is long-term. The, the short-term question uh, asks whether land values are going to be higher, lower, or remain the same uh, in the next 12 months, so over the next year. And there is a little bit of pessimism there. 13% say lower. That's a relatively high percent compared to uh, where we've been uh, recently. But 39% said higher. And so that tells me there's still quite a bit of optimism there. Uh, that, that land values are going to, to remain relatively high. Uh, we don't ask them what percent uh, increase. We just say increase, decrease, or remain the same. But the fact that the, the number that say it's going to be higher rather, you know, rather than lower tells me that they're not expecting a drop in land values like we saw in 14, uh, 2014 in the United States. Okay. Uh, and that would be consistent with my uh, crystal ball, too. Uh, that that's where we're heading, probably for small increases, but nevertheless increases. Uh, five years from now is a different animal uh, because usually when you look out five years from now, land value tends to increase. Even if you have one or two years where it declines over a five-year period, it tends to increase. And so much more optimism uh, looking looking out five years there, 62% uh, say that land values will be higher uh, five years from now. And I, if I was answering this survey, I would be in the higher category myself. Yeah, me too. Okay. Okay. Excellent. That is farmland value. Can I ask you one a quick thing, question? One other, oh, one oh. other question I wanted to elaborate on there. I should have elaborated on that. We also asked this, what is the reasons why uh, you think land values are going to be higher five years from now? And I think you'll find this very interesting. Um, even though Strong cash flows, inflation, very and, and various other factors are are listed by producers. The one that receives the most uh, the most uh, responses uh, as a percentage is non-farm investor demand. And so, you know, when they go to the when when farmers go to the auction, there's usually someone outside of agriculture. It could be somebody retired in a local community. It it could be it could be an institutional investor. Uh, that that's also interested in land values. And so we're picking that up. That's been true for quite a while now uh, when we asked, well, why do you think land values are, are going to increase? And so uh, at least from the U.S. perspective, that, that's a very important, uh, you know, very important result uh, to kind of keep track of. Uh, it's not just fundamentals in agriculture that are important. It's also what is the relationship between farmland uh, and stock values, stock prices. And, and, uh, and, and the bottom line there, there is no relationship that's why outside investors like to look at land. They want to they want to invest in something that's not correlated uh, with all their other assets, and so uh, farmland gets a, a gets gets noticed uh, outside of agriculture as being a place uh, to park money. Okay, excellent. Sorry, Michael, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Almost cut you off at the beginning. You mentioned something about land. It accounts for eighty percent of assets on the financial. Is that what you yeah, said? On the U.S. farm balance sheet, it's 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 right right at eighty three percent. If you look at the latest balance sheet, now that's got all part time and full time farms included. That's all of U.S. agriculture. If you looked at full time farms, uh, the percentage would still be high, but it'd probably be closer to sixty five to seventy percent. Okay. 
Okay, excellent. I know I updated my net worth statement. That seems weird talking about it, but farmers financial, we talk about it. I'm not giving my numbers away, but I updated our net worth statement. And man, is the the land lovely. We were fortunate enough, like many farmers right now, to have some land purchased when it was much yeah. cheaper and has gone up so much in the time that we've farmed. So I look at that, I'm like, mm, nice asset. I love land. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 kind of the saw there, though, it's a double-edged a sword. I mean, it, it, you like to see it go up, obviously, but yes. that doesn't translate into cash. Right. So you're not going to sell it anytime soon, so it doesn't translate into cash. And so, and so we always got to keep that in mind. Uh, over time, farmland has been a good investment uh, for 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 farmers. I mean, it, uh, and so it's it's been a, a very valuable asset and, a, and an income earning asset over time. But it's it's not something you can lay your hands on necessarily, unless you borrow against uh, the land value. We all know that so you got to be a little bit worried about doing that because you got to repay the loan. Uh, right. and, and so that's always important to, to, to note, even though it is a very important source of, of, of equity. Uh, it's not a source of equity you can necessarily get your hands on quickly. And so that's why that's why I go back to liquidity, how, why it's so important to to look at some of the other assets on the balance sheet, particularly current assets. And how does that compare uh, to some of your bills that are coming up in the next year, making sure that you have enough current assets to cover uh, those current obligations, because you, you're not going to you're not going to rely on land equity uh, to cover that. I love it. OK, that is excellent. The next question we touched on it last time, and this is USA specific. So forgive me if it's outdated. I'm not sure if we need an update, but the last time we chatted, I asked you about Congress passing a farm bill in 2023. You gave your answer. Do you want to touch on that? Of course, I don't follow that as much as I should. Yes, uh, uh, we're relatively pessimistic right now that it's going to happen in 23. Uh, we've, got, we've got a looming potential government shutdown uh, in, in October uh, that that might happen and, and that that would make the process even slower and so uh, I don't think we're going to see anything until 24 uh, and they also have to well, the, the the US uh, the US farm bill process is, is also fairly complicated because in addition to being uh, farm bill oriented it also has the food stat food stamp or the snap program included. And so there's different political constituencies constituencies interested in 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 a certain part of the farm bill and not as interested in the other part of the, part of the farm bill and vice versa. And so the, this is one case where the where the two parties in the United States have to come together uh, and come to some kind of agreement on how big the food stamp program is going to be and 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 not only how much money are we going to use for for farm government programs but how are we going to spend that money are we going to spend it on more on conservation efforts are we going to spend it more on 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 corn soybean and wheat uh production support and so and so uh, and so uh, the long story short uh it's i think it's going to be well into 24 before we see anything okay excellent forgive the upcoming rant here i don't want to talk politics because wow let's just blow the show up with a discussion of politics even though i'd imagine i know the demographics pretty well but i won't go there just a high level conversation i think in the last couple of years more than ever politics are just so fiery explosive and i've followed politics here closer and i would imagine there is nothing more frustrating than having an eye on the political system and going what are you guys doing like yeah. just let me run this for you <laughs> yeah and and we call that we call it, we have a, a source of risk that this that, that is involved here uh it's much bigger than politics but politics are part of it and we call it strategic risk essentially what strategic risk is 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 shocks uh, to markets or, or shocks to the system. And so a major change in a government program, uh, you know, uh, one of the shocks that we're seeing in, in the United States uh, is is, is uh, uh, more green energy, more interesting green energy. Well, that's a shock to the system that you couldn't necessarily see. And so you may have to change your strategy uh, you know, associated with that. And quite frankly, it does cause quite a bit of uncertainty and it does impact the barometer. When you see shocks like that, usually the sediment does go down a little bit. Uh, you know, for example, uh, when we had it, we had a uh, a trade dispute uh, a few years ago re related to soybeans in China. Uh, sediment went down 
uh, during during that period because of that that, that dispute was going on. Another example: the Ukraine uh, Russia uh, conflict has caused has caused some uh, uh, concern, and so anything like that. Uh, and that causes shock to markets. Uh, it really does uh, create a, a farmer to, to, to step back and think: Is, is the current strategy I'm using is that going to be uh, is that going to be relevant as we as I move through this shock, as I adjust uh, to this shock to the system? And 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 so it's not just government programs. There's a lot of other things uh, that are going around the world that that make farming even more difficult uh, than it already is. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's unpredictable and challenging with the weather and everything we got to deal yes. with, variables, costs. And then it just seems the last bunch of years, it's like, <laughs> we're going to add another level to you guys and another one. It's yes. like you're not stressed yeah. enough already, right? <laughs> yeah. Up here, we have carbon, carbon taxes and all kinds of stuff. So I yeah. imagine it's always been stressful being farmers, but it just seems with political concerns and everything going around the world it, it just, just increases it, the stress increases yeah, the risk it just gets more and more interesting i'll and, use air quotes and, and one thing about that though that source of risk i mean i've got a student that's working on a, a thesis related to this topic so uh, this is a topic that obviously interests me quite a bit and one of the things about that about that source of risk is our traditional pro support programs don't really cover it mm -hmm. uh, you know the government payments were not designed to cover that kind of risk. Uh, they just weren't, uh, whether that be conservation or whatever the, the program that you're talking about, even our crop insurance program, they, were, they weren't they were developed to handle that that source of risk. And so that's why it creates so much stress is, is, is our current programs, uh, you know, current things that we can do uh, to mitigate risk don't really fit. And so, like I said, you gotta, you gotta completely completely rethink or, or examine your strategy and say, you know, is what we what we thought we were going to do in the next five years is that going to work under this new environment? And and uh, uh, so a lot of a lot of uh, family discussions uh, about uh, how they should proceed, how they should grow, uh, what, what assets they should buy. All of this is impacted by uh, what I call the, the strategic risk. Okay, I love it. That's some good commentary. Okay. We went through all the questions I needed to ask you. We chat about the farm bill. Is there anything else that you want to touch on before I get you to leave us with your final parting thoughts? I actually would. One of the questions that I, I, I talk about frequently uh, in, in programs like this is uh, we have a question that basically asks farmers their biggest concern. What okay. keeps you up at night? I, I think uh, I think you'll find that interesting. Uh Input costs are still at the top of the list, and so even though we've seen uh, some some reductions in, in input costs, particularly fertilizer, uh, you know, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is cheaper today than it was six months ago, and twelve months ago, and eighteen months ago, and so that that's certainly good news. But there's still a lot of concern, and and the, and the reason why I think there's concern is prices haven't, besides fertilizer, prices haven't really declined. And so let's go back to machinery. We saw those increases in machinery prices that are considerably higher than what we saw pre-COVID. They haven't been reduced. And so the analogy I used you know, when I uh, to to explain this is think about going into the grocery store. And and for us, I look at hamburger. I, I look at uh, I look at other items in the grocery store, and I remember what the price was prior to COVID. They're higher. And so even though the, the rate of increase has, has, has leveled off, they're still relatively high. And so that's why I think that's ranked as the biggest concern, because it increases our break-even prices. Uh, the second one night right now is, is rising interest rates. That's a, that's a concern, but it does come in second. Uh, I probably would rank that first uh, if I was doing this one. And then third, uh, lower crop and livestock prices. Uh, but again, we have some producers that's higher prices, the beef in particular, uh, and other producers with lower, but that that comes in third. And so I think that that's kind of interesting because it tells me uh, what's on what's on farmers' minds. Uh, the the input costs, they're concerned about their break evens, uh, they're concerned about the output prices, obviously, and then they're particularly concerned about those rising interest rates because you know even if the interest rates don't impact land values right now, because maybe you borrowed money several years ago and you got to a low fixed rate, long term they will. So if the interest rates does stay up, uh, that will that will impact negatively uh, land values and and uh, machinery and building uh, prices uh, long term. 
Uh, that, that's just that's just the way asset markets work. Increase in interest rates, reduction, uh, reduction in the asset values, and so uh, and so that that's probably I would probably rank that uh, as my top concern. And and we had a question in in August uh, that basically asked, do you think the increase in interest rates is over? And about a third of them said there was another one to two percent increase coming. I think that's a little pessimistic, but who knows? It depends on how strong the economy is and many other factors. It it could happen. Uh, and, and there was also uh, there was also a third or so that said they were going to re, uh, going to be lower. Uh, I think that is wishful thinking. Uh -huh. But you could paint a scenario where if the economy is really strong, that maybe these maybe they'll back off of the the, the increases in the interest rates. And then another third that said they'd go up zero to one percent, which is about what the Fed Federal Reserve of the United States is expecting uh, to happen in the next twelve months. And so, uh, and so I think I think that's uh, that's also a, an interesting tidbit uh, coming out of the August survey results. We just had another interest rate increase. I think for this one they weren't expecting it, and it caught everybody off guard. But we had another interest rate increase. So, interesting times. That Sharp is for sure. Pencils, right? Yeah, that is for sure. Okay. So I like that. I like that last question. We'll have to, I'll have to add that in for our next go round at this. Final parting thoughts. Did you want to add some thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think there, I, I think the, the uncertainty is certainly impacting the, 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 the sentiment as you'd expect. And, and one of the things we haven't talked about today, but is very real, we've been starting to do some of this with some, uh, uh, with some analysis here, uh, you know, with, with students and, 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 uh, and, and, and ourselves, is there's a lot of difference in sentiment among producers. And so you've got some people that are extremely pessimistic. And you've got some people that are relatively optimistic. And just a, a couple words about that. Uh, those, those that are optimistic really do really do answer the, the survey questions differently. Those that are optimistic are more likely to, to be optimistic regarding land values, to be optimistic regarding financial performance, to be optimistic uh, regarding the capital investment, and on and on down the line. And so and when we talk about aggregates like this, uh, it, it's always important to, to say not everybody has the same opinion. In fact, the opinions are very, very different. Uh, you know, and 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 and, and, and I, I want to I want to signal back or circle back to to we talked about strategic risk and uncertainty. That's why we have these differences. Everybody has the same facts that they're looking at, the same fundamentals in terms of input prices, output prices, and interest rates. But because of all these uncertainties, we really view the future much, much differently. Uh, and 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 it just it, it, to me, it just tells me the value uh, of doing things like this sediment survey because uh, you start to get a handle on uh, you know why uh, you know, why are people so divergent in in terms of their their opinions? What is that related to? And you can start really digging under the surface, uh, you know, for for uh, you know how how people make decisions. Michael, I'm going to share a personal note there, and I normally don't get too very personal in my episodes, but speaking about optimistic and pessimistic, I get that because I have now been both both people. So I'm 41 years old. I'm giving it away here. And all my life I've been go achieve, excellent, everything works out. I'm positive. I'm optimistic. But the last couple of years changed me with everything that we went through here in Canada, the lockdowns, everything, the uncertainty. Yeah. I am no longer the Tracy that was Tracy up until the pandemic hit. I'm a different person. I'm working on moving back, but that foundation has been shook a little bit and I am a different person. And the funny thing, I could see how people would answer this different. If I was old Tracy, all these questions, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, good. It'll all work out. New Tracy, I'd be like, mm. the Tracy that sits here is working on being that old person again. But I get it. You're just fundamentally different as a person. Yeah, I think and I think you make a very good point. I think COVID, COVID really did change people's uh, attitudes. Yeah. Uh, about the, about about optimism and, and and pessimism and and I I'm I've always been really optimistic long term when it comes to production of agriculture because we got several things really really in our favor if you, if you look at where we're at in 
uh, in this part of North America uh, is one of the most productive regions in the world uh, when, it, when it comes to producing food. And we're going to need need uh, to increase food production because we have a growing population, uh, at least for several more decades yet, and a population that's going to have more money. And so they have more money to buy things like, uh, you know, quality beef cuts. And so there's room to be really optimistic. But now I temper that just like you, I temper that because uh, I'm I'm concerned about certain trends, uh, you know, that, that are happening. And, and I'm, I'm worried that we're going to do things that are going to going to prevent us from uh, from from achieving productivity gains uh, without getting into too specifics. I worry about that. I, I worry, for example, I worry about are we going to move towards electric vehicles too fast? Uh, and is that going to hurt? Is that going to hurt uh, productivity? Because quite frankly, we have to continue to increase productivity, increase yields, increase efficiency in livestock production if we're going to meet the growing food demands that we're going to see here in the next 20 to 30 years. And and so and so quite often uh, people don't think about trade offs. Uh, if if I if I do something that that that's going to 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 uh, to change carbon, for example. What does that do to productivity and vice versa? They're both important. We need to think about all of these things, but we always got to keep. I always keep in the back of my mind how because I'm a productivity person. That's that's what I've studied uh, my whole career. How is this going to impact productivity, and are we moving too fast? And so I, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic today uh, compared to prior to COVID, where I was probably more of a uh, more of a gang, you know, a, a, a full steam ahead uh, opt, 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 uh, optimist. Yeah, me so too. I think I'm exactly like what you were saying, and I, and I think a lot of people are. Oh, good. I wasn't gonna say it, but I'm like, you know what? I have a feeling, or I hope it resonates with other people. And I'm I'm happy to hear that you feel that way too. Not that you feel that way. I'm, I'm not happy yeah. you feel that way, but it's interesting to get the feedback that others feel the same, right? Definitely. And, and I, and I see in the comments, when I, you know, when, I, you, when I, we have an open-ended question at the end and I always look at, take a look at those and, and I've never correlated that with how they answer the, the five sediment questions, but you could. You can see some of the people have some very negative comments about certain policies or prices or things like this. Other people don't. Other people don't. They either have no comments, or their or their comments are really quite optimistic. You know, someone's coming back to the farm, and they're excited for that, and you know, you know this and that, and what have you. And so, uh, and, and so these are interesting times to be uh, to be in this business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I'm excited. I hope we're going to line this up again. Date to be determined. Yeah. And I I hope you're I hope you are excited and willing to come back yeah. on because it's always nice to see the egg barometer and how farmers are feeling. That's what I was going to say earlier Michael, really quick. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt you at the beginning. This is the discussion that we just had uh, and shared our thoughts and how we feel. What I like about the egg barometer is it's nice for farmers to tune into this episode and go, oh, okay, other farmers feel the same because we can be so yeah. solitary in our business and yeah. you spin your wheels, you get worried, you get in your silo. This is a great episode to tune into and go, oh, this other farmers feel the same or they don't. Oh, maybe I should be more confident, right? It's a good feeling, feeling. Yes, it is. Feeling yes, in fact, is. right? Yeah. 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 And uh, I just uh, just throw this out. December, January is a nice time frame because usually when we get a little closer to the end of the year, people have a much better idea of where they're at financially. And we usually see a movement <laughs> up or down <laughs> towards the end of the year, beginning of the, of the early in the year because of that, because they went to their their tax person and they said, oh, this year is better than I thought it was going to be. Or I think this year it's going to be the opposite. Uh, they're going to go in and say, oh, I didn't get a very good price for my crops here this fall. Uh, 23 is going to be a little worse than I thought it was going to be. And so I, I, I it could go either way, uh, you know, in terms of uh, up or down, but we usually get a, a pretty sizable movement in the barometer as we move, get, get towards the end of the year. Okay. I look forward to it. It's a podcasting date, Michael. If you're good, okay. I'm good. Same place, different yep. time. Okay. One last call out. If people are listening and they want to actually see the survey, read, go through it, where can they find that? 
the, the best place is to go to the Center for Commercial Agriculture website. It has a lot of other material on there, but the Ag Economy Barometer is one of the one of the more important things I think that we do uh, in the center. And so it, it's front and center on the front page. Uh, you'll have no problem finding it. Uh, if you type Ag Economy Barometer, U.S. Ag Economy Barometer into your website, you'll probably get to a separate page. There's a separate page uh, for the Ag Economy Barometer too, but but I would I would, uh, I would would encourage them to go out, go in the homepage of Center for Commercial Agriculture because we have other stuff there too. Uh, and, and so for example, I'm in, I'm in finance and we got a lot of publications related to, to ag finance. If you want to learn more about that topic, uh, you can take a look at the other stuff that we have. Excellent, and I'll put links. Michael, it was a fantastic conversation as always. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing this information. I appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Take awesome. care. And you in the audience, thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this, like it, share it, get it out there so other farmers can learn about the Egg Barometer Survey. Thank you, guys, and see you next week. Bye-bye.